and we are live with tonight's AMA with Sean Parent. I want to welcome the folks in Hobilo and this also streaming to LinkedIn so people will, you know, slowly trickle in from LinkedIn to Hobilo or just view this on LinkedIn. I do want to say that I prefer the questions to be asked on Hobilo as I will, you know, prioritize them. But if you have any questions on LinkedIn, uh, naturally some people will ask them in the chat and I will also try to cover those. Um, and with that, let's get started. Um, Sean Parent tonight here to answer your questions. And I guess some of you are wondering who Sean Parent is, what does he, what is he doing in the recent life of C++? So Sean, please introduce yourself. Okay, uh, so I'm Sean Parent. I'm a senior principal scientist at Adobe. Uh, I've uh, worked there almost 30 years now. Uh, I did take a, a short break in the middle to uh, work at Google uh, on Chrome OS. And prior to coming to Adobe, I worked at Apple in the system software team, uh, working on the transition from 68K machines to PowerPC machines ages ago. Um, uh, my current role at Adobe is running Adobe Software Technology Lab. So I've got a small team. There are four of us all together. Uh, uh, our charter is to take a long, long range view of uh, uh, trying to improve the code that engineers write. So we're not so concerned with, with process as we are with uh, 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 what engineers type when they actually sit down at the keyboard. And so some of the things we're looking at are the challenges of writing correct concurrent code. Um, uh, uh, challenges around the complexity of C++ and the lack of safety in C++ um, and and challenges around how we educate our workforce and kind of bring everybody up to up to speed so so that's who I am let's see do we have any questions coming in um, yes this would be now the time to ask a question um, so if you have questions in Hobilo, uh, I prefer strongly the Q&A tab. So if you ask a question there, that's where I will choose from. If I see a question in the chat, I also will be happy to uh, take that there. And of course, people on LinkedIn uh, ask questions. See, there are already some uh, people saying hello from LinkedIn. Yeah. And there is currently... Let's start with an easy question. Um, what is your impression about the new C++ standard? Uh, uh, well, I don't know if we're talking about 20 or, or 23. Uh, right now, we're internally just moved to 17 after a very long effort. And uh, things like the uh, parallel algorithms are still missing from, from Apple's release of Clang. So we're not even fully on C++ 17 yet. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential in C++ 20. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to cleaning up some code with concepts. Um, uh, modules have a huge amount of potential. We haven't had much time to play with them yet. And uh, uh, coroutines, I think, have significant benefits in uh, structuring concurrency. Uh, so looking forward to those also. Uh, certainly, we've been, we've been writing some some experiments and playing with some of these features. C plus plus twenty three. I've been loosely tracking it. Uh, 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 you know, generally, I think the 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 feature set is good. You know, my ongoing issue with C plus plus has just been the the ever increasing size and complexity of the language. It's, it's, it's become very difficult uh, for both new and senior developers alike to kind of wrap their head around it. And when you have, you know, uh, a large company that's grown, which is, you know, Adobe's a, a fairly large company. Uh, we've grown largely through acquisition. And so we have engineering teams all over the world. And, and we don't have a homogenous environment like you would see at Google where we have a single set of coding guidelines and, and you know, from project to project code looks, looks very similar. 
Uh, instead, we have a lot of different teams that have developed their own ways of doing things, and then they're trying to share code with each other. And and it's it's uh, uh, amazing how different C++ code can, can look coming from two separate projects. Yeah, so there's a question from Hobilo on the status of your book. Status of my book. Uh, uh, that's actually a pretty high priority for the team right now. Um, so I've got uh, 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 Dave Abrahams has joined me in, in, uh, with the Software Technology Lab. Uh, uh, if you've been around C++ a long time, you'll probably remember the name. He was very involved with getting Boost going. Uh, uh, many years ago now, and then left the C++ community for a while to uh, work on Swift. So he worked on the Swift standard library and is one of the designers of Swift and then worked on uh, Swift UI at Apple. And I've managed to snag him and pull him over. Um, uh, and I've got uh, David Sinkel, who comes from Bloomberg, uh, who might have seen some of his talks at some of the conferences. And then a, uh, a younger individual, uh, Nick DeMarco, who uh, I worked with at Adobe a few years ago, and he left the company for a little while to try the startup thing. And I managed to convince him to come back uh, to join the Software Technology Lab. And so right now, we are all working on a, a course, uh, a Better Code course, which the idea is to uh, 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 use that as a way to develop the book further. So we've gathered up all of my piles of notes and presentations and sorted through those. Uh, we just did a dry run of the first three chapters with a small internal group of people. And uh, 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 it was very informative, kind of has us going back and, and, and reworking some stuff. Uh, uh, but but we're moving. I'm I'm adding co-authors and uh, 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 busy writing and and busy making progress on it. Finally, it's been a very very long time where it's kind of sat on the shelf. Uh, uh, so so yeah, no schedule yet. Uh, <laughs> but it is it is it is uh, uh, actually moving. So that's good. Okay, let me see the next question. What worked best on achieving C++ developers writing better code so far? Can you share some examples or reasonings? What has worked best? Uh, 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 you know, certainly the kind of no raw loops thing has resonated and I think had the, the broadest impact. Um, uh, the the there's an arc to the to the to the book and my talks and and the class that we're developing um, uh, around relationships and and this is is the idea that it's 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 the the things that happen uh, 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 between the objects that don't happen in the code that tend to be problematic in in the system and so how do you go about identifying what the essential relationships are and and uh, 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 codifying those and coming up with a system to reason about those uh, uh, within your code. So I think as we start to get that message across, that's had a, a significant impact on how people think about their code and, 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 and uh, approach development. So. And let me choose a question from LinkedIn. What is the future of WAL? Does it remain an experiment to try new things or will it become a production ready language? Uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, Dave Abrahams right now is in Kona. He just gave a talk uh, yesterday evening to the C++ Standards Committee uh, presenting some of the ideas in VAL. Um, for people who don't know, uh, uh, Val is a, a language uh, that was uh, uh, created by Dave Abrahams and uh, 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 Dimitri, uh, uh, I'm going to butcher his last name, record on. And, and it's uh, uh, in, 
in its flavor, it's very similar to Swift, uh, but it's uh, 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 even more safe by default. Uh, uh, so in that sense, it bears some resemblance to Rust, uh, but it pulls off, off Rust level safety, uh, including around concurrency, uh, without the need for all the annotations. And so we think it has potential to be a more approachable language. Um, uh, uh, right now, the work has been mostly done uh, uh, by Dave and Dimitri. Uh, we've got another external contributor, Lucian. And then uh, my team is, is starting to look at how, how we can contribute. Uh, we had a meeting uh, with Herb Sutter not too long ago, trying to inject some of the ideas from Val into uh, uh, his CPP2 effort. We've also had conversations uh, with uh, uh, folks working on carbon uh, around trying to get uh, uh, some of these ideas injected into carbon. And I think, think we're having, having an impact there. Uh, we're also stealing one of Herb Sutter's ideas. And right now we're working on a, a transpiler um, uh, so that you can compile Val code into C++ code. And through that, we're going to try to work on, on C++ interop. Um, uh, so the, uh, you know, it started as kind of a purely academic exercise. It's been moving very rapidly in the last several weeks, uh, rapidly enough that we're trying to get a few more arrows behind it and just see where it evolves. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm not committing to it becoming, you know, a, a, a commercially viable system uh, 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 on its own at this point. Uh, there's still still a long ways to go before we get there. Uh, 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 but it's, you know, the more we play with it and the more we look at it, I think there's the ideas there are interesting enough uh, that we're, like I said, we're investing a little more and, and trying to see see where it plays out. So. And how much are you personally involved in VAR? Uh, 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 you know, t well, I manage Dave Abraham, so it's kind of kind of his baby. Um, uh, to date, I've been involved mostly as a as an advisory and helping out with some of the papers and and and, and things on it. Uh, but yeah, I'm hoping to to get a little dirty, especially as we're working on on C plus plus interop. And so roll up my sleeves and and write some code. Okay. Um, Connor Hoekstra asked, in your CPP North 2022 keynote, you mentioned the difference between programming languages that are efficient by definition versus efficient by optimization. Can you elaborate on this? A lot of C++ speed come from O2 slash O3 compiler optimizations. Yeah, so... So, so the, the, the basic idea is, is at a high level, uh, 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 do you have guarantees about things that will or will not happen? And for example, um, uh, return value optimization in C++ uh, has something that's been allowed for, for uh, 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 many years, you know, going back to, to uh, C++03. Um, uh, but it's not till C plus plus seventeen that that it's it's mandated, and so you couldn't couldn't rely on it before then, and and when you're developing code um, uh, uh, that's performance critical, it's important that that even your debug builds reach a certain level of performance, and that you can get consistent performance. Uh, 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 in a wide variety of environments. So right now, you know, the, uh, I work closely with the Photoshop team and the Photoshop team builds all of their code for, uh, you know, iOS and Android and Wasm and Linux and Mac and Windows. And so it's a fairly broad suite of, of uh, uh, compilers and platforms that come into play. And so... So you need sets of, of guarantees. Um, uh, so for example, uh, 
uh, many of the functional languages, you know, present this uh, uh, illusion that everything is a copy, and then you rely on the copies uh, uh, not happening under under the hood and getting optimized away. Um, uh, but what that means is is inefficient code where the optimizer can't see through what you're doing and efficient code looks identical. And as a developer, you don't have control over that. Um, uh, uh, so uh, uh, one of our goals around Val is to uh, 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 even take things a little further than, than C++, which is to make sure that even uh, copies where they happen are explicit. And so the model in Val is, is implicit moves are allowed, uh, but implicit copies are not. And so even if you want to copy an int, it's an explicit uh, statement to, to copy an int. And, and uh, uh, you know, personally, I find that, that, that much, much better. Uh, uh, with concurrency, this gets you know, much harder. If you look at a language uh, like Haskell, uh, concurrency is really just a compiler flag in a, in a purely functional system. You can just turn it on, and the optimizer will try to find places where it can run code concurrently. And you'll pick up you know, a small performance win in a typical Haskell code base. And if you're very careful about how you construct your code and you know what the optimizer is going to do, you can get significant wins um, uh, uh, by, by turning on concurrency. And so, you know, a challenge in a programming model is how do you enable concurrency in such a way uh, uh, that a developer can, can reason through it and, and get, uh, uh, kind of you know guarantees around the scalability of their performance, and make that explicit in the code. So, so that's what I I mean by by those things. Um, uh, so yes, it doesn't you know completely remove the need for having you know O2 and O3 and letting the the compiler go off and and do further optimizations, but you do want to establish a baseline. Uh, things that I'd love to see in C++. It's uh, uh, you know, I'd love to see some changes to the destructor ordering rule so that objects can destruct after last use instead of having to wait until they, they're they at the end of scope. And if you did that, that would enable uh, 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 things like tail recursion optimizations. And, um, uh, you know, I think that we could do that in such a way that you could have explicit guarantees around where you got tail recursion optimizations and things like that. And if you look, um, you know, the game community complains quite frequently that debug builds, uh, you know, where, where the debugger uh, or where the compiler is turning off inlining become unusable with modern code because you get super deep nests of, of function calls. Uh, uh, with a lot of the template heavy code like boost or kind of code that's using functional paradigms. And the only way that that works efficiently is if you have your optimizer come in and inline all of that code and remove all of those function calls. Um, uh, but that makes things more difficult to debug. So, you know, how do we get to a world where you can have, have your debug builds uh, run at a higher level performance and not generate, you know, hundred unnecessary layers on your stack. That is true. Speaking of the stack, speaking of coroutines, do you think as is the feature is production ready? Do I think the feature is production ready? Um, it's production ready. I mean, it's, it's, it's a well-designed, well, it's, it's a thought through and, 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 and in some sense, a, a well-designed system for coroutines. I mean, certainly in C++ 20, the biggest thing missing is the library support to make it actually usable. There's, you know, uh, uh, you know understanding how coroutines work and constructing them is, is, a, is a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. uh, my biggest complaint there is exactly what we were just talking about, which is that uh, the model for coroutines implies a heap allocation. And in that sense, I think it's, it's an outlier for the C++ language. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, you know, invoking a function usually doesn't imply that there's a heap allocation uh, uh, on that function invocation. And, and, you know, for example, lambdas don't, don't do heap allocations compared to, say, Objective-C blocks, which do. Um, uh, 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 there's, there's a rationale and a reason for why that heap allocation is there, and sometimes your compiler can optimize it away. But I think it's very telling that things like uh, 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 Eric Niebler's sender's receiver's code uh, really doesn't use coroutines internally uh, because uh, Eric doesn't want the heap allocations and can't rely. There's no guarantees about when the compiler can optimize those away. And they'll almost always appear in, in debug builds. And uh, 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 so in that sense, I think the, the, the feature is a little the design of the feature for coroutines is a little unfortunate. I think, um, uh, uh, you know, it's it's kind of a weird thing that declaring a coroutine isn't actually declaring a function, which is what it looks like. It's more akin to declaring an object or a struct, and and then the the invocation of it, um, uh, I think, should be purely on the stack unless you explicitly heap allocate it, as opposed to it magically getting heap allocated and you're getting a coroutine handle for the for the for the allocated object. Um, uh, so, yeah, I I, I I think it could have been better. Um, yeah, it's complicated system. It is. Some parts <laughs> are missing. I think at 23 we'll bring further improvements, and then there is it's a new model. People have to get used to it. Yep. And it's not like something which was prior, like not in the standard, but in available of a lot of libraries. Um, there's a question on books. Um, Sean, I believe you have advocated developers to look at the work of Stepanov. In my self-study, I've been reviewing functional programming and category theory. Is this analogous and worth looking at, or should we stick with elements of programming? <laughs> uh, both, um, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, category theory is interesting. I think it's very easy to get lost in category theory. And, you know, at the end of the day, category theory is looking at, at how, how, how things compose, uh, uh, but it's devoid of semantics and, and elements of programming is, is very strong on 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 looking at things by starting with defining what they actually do. Um, uh, 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 so you know, I think there's there's things to be learned uh, from from category theory. Uh, certainly, there's a lot to be learned from functional programming. I think uh, you know most developers would would do well to. To spend a little time doing functional programming if they didn't didn't do it in school, um, uh, 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 it uh, uh, makes you cognizant that there is you know for for any problem there's a, a different approach that doesn't require mutation, and and you get you know immediate guarantees around around safety, and there's concurrency benefits and things of that nature at the same time doing something like sort becomes inefficient and, and much more complex. Um, uh, uh, you know, so, so studying kind of both approaches, you know, the EOP approach and the, the functional programming approach, I think will give you some insights into, in, into, you know, what's the better approach for a given, for a given operation. And, you know, anything can be written in a, you know, in an in, in situ form, kind of where you do modifications in place, uh, uh, or a functional form where you return a result, um, and then functional forms can be either lazy or eager, um, uh, and there are are trade offs with each of those approaches, and those trade offs are different for for any given problem that you're trying to solve. So, so I think as a developer, getting to the point where you're familiar with what those trade offs are in any anything you're trying to solve, you can approach it in all three different ways and um, uh, evaluate the trade-offs is, is a good thing. So. That is true. Um, 
From the code safety and correctness perspective, what is your opinion on error codes versus exceptions? Uh, I gave a talk on that um, uh, uh, called uh, uh, Exceptions the Other Way Around, which is, which is available on, online. Uh, uh, so my, you know, my opinion is that, uh, uh, you know, error codes that need to be explicitly handled, uh, uh, even if it's, you know, through a monadic, monadic composition, you know, where you have a language that's got like a dot question mark or something that can, that can, you know, chain or not chain, uh, uh, depending on whether or not you, you've got an error. Um, uh, uh, error codes are, are unnecessarily problematic and they just pollute your code base with noise. And so I am not a fan of error codes. Uh, the C++ exception handling has some issues of its own. Um, uh, 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 you know, it, it has some costs that, that come in because it, it drags in, in uh, uh, RTTI, which is not an opt-in system. Um, uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, operator new can throw, even though on on most OSs, it really can't because the OS is going to overcommit. Um, uh, but the compiler still has to generate the exception tables uh, in part because operator new is a replaceable operation, which means it could be replaced at dynamic link time when your application is loaded. So the compiler can't really determine whether or not operator new will throw or not. Um, uh, it just means that the that C++ exception handling is is heavier weight than 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 it could or should be. Um, uh, uh, but you know, go watch my talk. I really think that that you know, going to an, an, an error code environment or uh, you know uh, 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 you know any of the uh, 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 proposed kind of you know ex expected uh, uh, result types that do monadic composition I think are 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 largely going backwards and and are brought about by people's just uh, 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 own squeamishness around exception handling. Okay, so you're not you're not a fan of expected. I am not a fan of expected. No, not at all. Okay, so there's a couple of questions about like basically boiling down. What do you think about carbon? What do I think about carbon? Um, uh, you know, it's 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 interesting. It's got potential. Uh, uh, we're monitoring it. So David Sankel uh, on my team is uh, is attending the the carbon meetings, and we've had a a, a few uh, a larger meetings with the with the carbon team. Um, uh, 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 I think carbon is is right now a little too hand wavy for for my comfort level it's it's largely trying to tackle the governance issue with c++ um uh, uh and from a language standpoint it's uh, uh basically going with the c++ ox model of of um uh, 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 generics which i think is a is a good move but but it's largely ignoring um, uh, safety at this point. It's, uh, I think, kind of uh, uh, getting rid of references in favor of pointers. Uh, even if you have the notion of non-null pointers uh, adds complexity. It's it's not a simplification that they that they think it is. Um, uh, you know, and so so we're watching it. I'm. You know, I would say right now I'm I'm not a fan of the of the design as it is or the direction it's going in, um, but you know maybe just a simplification of the C plus plus syntax um, uh, and assuming they can pull off interop, which is a big question at this point. They haven't demonstrated that yet. Uh, uh, you know, maybe that's enough, right? So. So it's got a lot of arrows behind it. So it's, it's hard to, to rule out. 
Yeah, I think from all the languages which came into light this year, they are more like an idea and other languages already, like, you know, Sean uh, mentioned Herb Sutter's approach of, you know, having the idea to actually compile to C++ and not try to, to build up on one of the compilers might be the better way for, for some people. Um, let me see what questions we have. Um, Oh yeah, so like when we talk about Herb, um, what's your view on Herb such as CPP2? Uh, I, I think it's a good piece of work. Um, uh, 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 that's, you know, we're having conversations with them. Uh, 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 in fact, that was one of the reasons why Dave Abrams is out in Kona right now was to, was to spend some time with, with Herb Sutter and Gabby uh, discussing CPP2. Um, uh, uh, I think buried in CPP2 is a, a, a simpler a approach that's actually more capable. Um, uh, 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 looking at it, uh, uh, we think they're just a, a hair away from getting thread safety. Um, uh, you know, out of their safety model and their current safety model uh, uh, rules out uh, some constructs like sharing immutable data, uh, which actually are safe. So kind of, I think the design goes a little overboard on some edges and not far enough in others. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, but it's, uh, uh, it's a relatively, you know, solid design. At, at this at this point, so so I'm I'm encouraged by it. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah. I liked it when I saw the keynote. I also like that uh, he keeps working on it. That's like was one of my biggest worries that I uh, hope like you know plans every year a science project at his keynote and then <laughs> where does it go from there. Yes. Uh, not always the best track record. Um, but I have a question on embedded. Which C++ features should be avoided while programming for microcontrollers? Uh, you know, uh, the last time I did embedded work was programming a Z8 processor, which had 2K of ROM and 128 bytes of RAM. Um, so, so I'm really not the the... Uh, 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 the the best person to 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 ask that question. Um, uh, uh, you know, I don't know. Use the features you can afford to use. I guess is the answer. Yeah. Um, any any C plus feature which you advise against in your own uh, coding guidelines? Um. Uh, no, our, our own coding guidelines, we try not well. So the, you know, things that I think are very problematic are things like uh, dynamic linking, um, uh, uh, which is not a C++ feature and that's part of the problem. Uh, uh, and it's especially bad if you're doing dynamic linking and you're trying to do symbol hiding with it, which puts you immediately in, in undefined behavior territory. Uh, and yet a lot of, a lot of teams and uh, a, a lot of products do exactly that. Um, uh, so that's an, an ongoing pain, pain point. Um, uh, 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 you know, basically, it's an ongoing effort to try to raise awareness of of what the rules are for a library versus an application. And you know, if you're if you're writing an application, you could replace operator new delete, for example. But if you're writing a library, uh, uh, you really can't without stepping on on the main application toes. Um, uh, uh, so you know, our guidelines are around things of that nature, and not around specific language features that you you should or shouldn't use on on the language feature front. We try to educate people as to as to you know, what things uh, 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 do and where are the sharp edges as opposed to, to making mandates about, you know, don't do X. 
you mentioned safety aspects of codes. What is the approach at Adobe to test safety relevant generic C++ code? The, a reasonably amount of templates, no excessive meta programming. Yeah. Um, you know, our approach, I think, is like most of the rest of the industry, uh, which is, you know, these days, which is trying to rely on uh, static analyzers to the extent that we can and sanitizers uh, to get us get us beyond that, um, uh, you know, from, from uh, an educational standpoint, we try to teach people about how to uh, uh, work in an environment where almost everything is a whole part relationship and, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting rid of shared pointers to mutable data and, you uh, 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 getting rid of, 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 of sharing data through uh, threads, except through ex explicit communication channels, uh, uh, things of that nature, um, uh, uh, which are all you know, built around ideas of safety. Uh, but yes, uh, uh, you know, I think like the rest of the industry in C++, it's a, it's a difficult nut to crack. Uh, personally, what I've been doing is is almost all the code I've been writing lately. Um, I actually write it first in Daphne, which is uh, a um, uh, 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 a language that can output in multiple languages, including C and um, uh, TypeScript and 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 some other languages. Uh, uh, but Daphne includes a, a proofing system, so you can write uh, pre and post, post conditions and loop invariants, and you can use uh, 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 existential and universal qualifiers, and the system will will uh, uh, prove your code is correct to the specification. And uh, uh, so, so it doesn't have a good C++ backend, but even my C++ code these days, I tend to be writing it in Daphne first and proving it correct and then just transcribing it into C++. So taking a little bit more of a formal methods approach. But um, uh, I know of at least you know one other person at Adobe who does a similar thing, but uh, but certainly I don't think we're going to get uh, uh, you know an entire company to start proving their code. Um, there's maybe a connected uh, question about ADA. What do you think why it's not getting as popular as C++ and other languages? Uh, you know, I, I, it's a good question. I don't know. And honestly, I haven't spent time looking at ADA in, in, uh, in, in many years. Um, uh, and it, it did come up recently in, a, in another conversation around, you know, ADA has checks some of the boxes that people are looking at for C++ successor languages. Um, uh, uh, but honestly, you know, it's on my it's on my list of things to to research a little more. I think the last time I tried to take a, a cursory look, I was surprised at how few of the platforms that we care about it's available for in any in any uh, 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 significant form. So that was a little little problematic at the time. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't have a firm opinion of ADA. Um, there is a question about reflections. What do you think about adding a reflection to C++? Should it be a must, a nice to have? Sean Baxter in the Circle Compiler and David Sankel have done a lot of progress on this, but uh, I don't see the committee much willing to change the language for work on this area. Yeah, um, uh, you know, I'm a Sean Baxter fan. Uh, I like what he's he's uh, been doing with Circle, and uh, certainly he's been doing a lot of interesting experimentation uh, uh, with the Circle compiler. Um, uh, I think it's unfortunate that the standard committee isn't listening to him more um, because he's certainly gaining experience and, and his approach is evolving. Uh, uh, I would really like to 
to see us have a much better compile time reflection in the language. And, um, uh, you know, I think if, if we have a good compile time reflection, it lets us build opt-in uh, uh, runtime reflection uh, uh, where that's useful. Uh, so I think that that's high value. I think the current state of affairs of trying to figure out what you can uh, declare const expert and when const expert things actually execute at compile time um, uh, uh, is is a difficult programming model and the the circle model of basically let you run anything at compile time uh, 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 you know I think is 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 an interesting and, and valid approach um, uh, you know I I disagree with the uh, with the naysayers who thought that you know having your compiler uh, running on your server being able to execute anything is a security violation because if you're like Adobe, what do we do? We compile a bunch of code to generate unit tests and then we execute all those unit tests on the server. Um, uh, so if it's a security hole, it's it's already been blown wide open, and not to mention the fact that the the current template mechanism is train complete. So you know it, you could you can do anything that way too. Um, uh, so so yeah, um, uh, I'm a fan. I would like to see more reflection. I think I think just some of the basic things that we still. You know, deal with the number of places in code where you have to, you know, map strings to enums back and forth, and uh, 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 just just common things like that. I think are 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 ridiculous. Uh, but certainly, I would like to be able to do things like you know, iterate all the members of a struct and uh, uh, you know, merge you know, write write compile time code that could merge two structs and generate a new struct and do things of that nature. So. Yeah, so there was like a very, very similar question, which we could, you know, continue now. It's like, do you think that we will be able to match with Java and C Sharp, or is it maybe a different language model which allows them to do more? Um, uh, I Well, I hope we don't try to match <laughs> Java and C Sharp. Both yeah. of those are, are, are built uh, 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 with the model that you have a class object, which is a runtime object, and the closest C++ gets to that is having the, the V table and and um, uh, the RTTI information, which is all all, all immutable data um, uh, and a little a little heavy weighted as it is. You know, I would like to see us move more towards getting opt in RTTI, or at least now an ability to opt out of RTTI. Uh, uh, within a class definition, and uh, uh, there are many techniques for building your own V tables. So I think having direct inheritance and uh, having the compiler generate V tables for you is a is an unnecessary feature of C plus um, plus. Uh, 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 that said, uh, there are uses where you do want you know the equivalent of a class object. And I think if you have enough compile time reflection, uh, uh, you can you can build that easily. I mean, you can certainly do it without compile time reflection. It just ends up being a lot of boilerplate code or a bunch of macros or or horrible copy and paste things. Um, I used to uh, 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 when Matt Ostern uh, 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 was kind of lead on C++ at Apple years and years ago. Uh, I used to argue with him that um, he was he was working on both C++ as well as as Objective C at Apple, and Objective C is another language that has class objects and 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 runtime reflection. And my challenge to him was how could you turn uh, 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 Objective C into a C++ library that was actually usable. And and that would kind of be my my challenge for the folks working on reflection in C++ is can you make uh, the Java and C sharp capabilities uh, be addable from a library and uh, you know in a usable form and 
and I think if we can we can get there, we will have accomplished a lot. So. And yes, there is, of course, a question about ABI. Is ABI stability holding back the evolution of C++? Uh, well, I, there, there's there's two ways to say that. I think if you broke ABI compatibility, it would it would stall C++ uh, uh, for for over a decade, right? Certainly, Adobe would have a very difficult time moving to a, a compiler or a tool chain that broke ABI compatibility. Um, uh, even small breaks in ABI compatibility historically have cost us several years uh, 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 just because there's such a large ecosystem of, of libraries and DLLs and things that are outside of our direct control and things that have to be coordinated because we have to build across different versions and different environments of things. Uh, 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 so. So of kind of a full ABI break uh, uh, would be very painful and I think would stall, stall the language, at least stall adoption of the language. Um, uh, 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 that said, I really think the standards committee uh, uh, should uh, uh, start to come to terms uh, uh, with the fact that, you know, a lot of development happens in, in DLLs, and a lot of those DLLs are built with symbol hiding to reduce their size, and that immediately puts you into undefined behavior. And, and the ABI communication between them is maybe specified by uh, uh, platform vendors, but certainly not specified at the language level. Uh, it's just kind of an unspoken rule that the language providers can't break it. and. I, I think C++ needs to figure out how they have an explicit uh, uh, ABI resiliency model, something along the lines of what Swift did, uh, uh, where you have have a set of constructs where you put in the uh, stake in the ground and you say these are for communicating across DLL boundaries, and you actually define what it means to build C++ code inside of a DLL. Um, uh, 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 and and you create a, a a resilient layer, which may come at a at a small runtime penalty uh, to use that layer and to speak across it. Um, uh, 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 so I don't think the the question is as simple as as you know break it yes no. It's uh, yes we want to break ABI stability so that we can evolve the language but to do so we need to put into place a resiliency layer so that people have some guarantees that they can migrate to and that's probably a many year poll because um, you want the resiliency layer in place first and give people time to migrate uh, 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 to that and then you can go and start breaking ABIs and, and you, you have an answer. So. So that's my answer on ABIs. Yeah, I. this was in, I think, 2021 when Bryce keynoted C++ Now. Um, he mentioned a paper, P2123. Um, which tries kind of to solve this Gordian knot by introducing interfaces and constructs to uh, say, um, break the ABI here for that standard, but leave the ABI alone for other standards. And I, I guess we also, you know, would like to have this ability for libraries to say this is library version X and we're breaking standard or we're breaking the ABI and otherwise we're not breaking the ABI. Um, I, I kind of like that idea, but I think it's also like an idea which needs to be more refined. And um, I'm not aware that like, this paper has you know, it's still reviewed and it's still under re review, probably in Kona now. Um, but I wonder if you have heard about that paper. I have heard about it. Um, uh, I haven't, I haven't uh, uh, spent time going through it. I was encouraged that somebody was looking at the problem. Um, uh, uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, Apple years ago had a, a tech note that they put out, which was the unfortunate title was something like C++ tips and tricks or something. But buried in there was was basically their statement on 
on minimal ABI compatibility uh, between DLLs and, and what that meant. And, and it, was, it was very restrictive um, uh, uh, at the time. And, and uh, 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 but I think that you can actually start with a relatively uh, 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 restrictive environment, right? Right. You just need to let people know what's what's guaranteed to work across the boundaries, and um, you know, and you need rules about you know what does it mean to have a single application that depends on say two different versions of Boost. Uh, uh, you know, that are coming in from DLLs, right? Right. How does that work? Um, I had that problem once. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have that that problem in spades. So. You create a CPP file, and only the CPP file is basically acting as a firewall. Yeah. And only that is like then connecting to the library which is uh, using or like connecting to APIs, connecting to the library which is using the old uh, boost version and you're not sure how to build with a new version. Yeah, and things like, you know, Apple's runtime, uh, their, their uh, Mako environment has, has a notion of two level namespaces, uh, which means that, you know, a DLL that includes a dependency, that dependency isn't automatically visible to other DLLs and things of that nature, but all of that is outside of the language and all of that is, is, is basically, you know, implementation defined behavior. Um, uh, and as far as the language is concerned, it's undefined behavior, you know, to, it's an ODR violation technically. Um, uh, 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 and so, yeah, I think that the, 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 the fact that everybody does it and nobody's working on trying to standardize a way to do it is very problematic. And what we run into all the time is people create a system that uh, uh, works on Windows, but then fails everywhere else. And and it's because of things like you know Windows does RTTI lookup by name, and every other platform does RTTI lookup by symbols. And so if you're hiding symbols, then on Windows, uh, names still are exposed uh, through RTTI. So things like a dynamic cast might work on, on, on Windows, but fail on Mac or vice versa, uh, depending on how you have things set up. And so these are all, all problematic things. And you know, the number of times where I hear you know, developers complain, we don't understand, uh, we're throwing an exception and we're catching the exception of the right type, uh, but it just blows past and doesn't get caught. And it's like, yeah, that's because you're throwing from one DLL through across the DLL boundary and, and a similar name wasn't exposed. And so an RTTI lookup failed. And so your catch failed and you, you ran off the, the end of your exception chain. Termination. Um, yep. Um, what do you think about having garbage collection on C++? I think garbage collection is generally a horrible thing, and, you know, a horrible idea. Right, it's uh, you know, garbage collection is for people who don't know what their pointers are doing, um, uh, uh, and so so I'm very much a fan of 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 precise lifetimes. Um, uh, in fact, I would like like more precise lifetimes than C plus plus offers. I would like objects to fall out of scope after last use, as opposed to at the end of the scope block. Um, uh, uh, Objective C and even Objective C plus plus works that way, which can throw you for a bit of a loop if you're if you're 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 used to the C plus plus rules. Um, uh, 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 so yeah, I mean, it, you know, in general, I'm against you know trying to share data. I try to make as few heap allocations as possible, which means I'm trying to generate as 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 little garbage as possible. Um, uh, uh, garbage collectors tend to cause, you know, indeterminate delays. They're blowing your caches. Uh, uh, they're limiting your memory, uh, basically for, for, you know, every, every byte of RAM I can give to Photoshop, Photoshop will run a little bit faster, um, uh, you know, and do less paging. So, so it's, uh, uh, 
not a fan. I've never been a fan of garbage collected systems. Okay. Um, we actually have someone asking you a beginner question. So as a C++ beginner, what areas should you focus on to improve your own career? What areas should you focus on? Wow, I, uh, to improve your own career, you know, I, I may not be the right person to ask. I tend to think uh, 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 it, it's it's not language specific. Basically, focus on on understanding programming. Um, uh, uh, so we mentioned before, uh, you know, EOP or studying functional programming, or going back to some of the classics, right? Right, reading. Uh, 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 Dykstra or Bob Targent's books, or or even trying to work your way through Knuth, um, uh, I think will have much more more benefit. Uh, kind of an approachable form of that is you can find all of the Train Award lectures online. Um, uh, uh, read them, you know, end to end. It, they're they're not that long. They're a few pages each. There's some some real gems in there. Uh, 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 so, so, you know, spend your time learning about the, the profession and, and programming being in C++ or, or any other language will come fairly naturally, right? Right. I spend, you know, most of my time in C++, uh, uh, but I was working on Photoshop web. And so I spent time in TypeScript and I've spent time in, in, Swift, and I've spent time in, uh, uh, you know, certainly a lot of time in Objective C and Objective C plus plus, and, and uh, you know, like I said, right now I'm writing most of my code in Daphne first. Um, uh, uh, the language really doesn't matter all that much. It's it's figuring out the ideas and and then how those ideas map into a particular language, and that usually doesn't take too long to figure out. So. So that would be my, my recommendation. Um, I think an interesting question has been asked about energy consumption. Do you think we will have compiler optimization for that end? I, I hope so. Um, uh, 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 in the single threaded environment, energy consumption maps fairly well to performance. Not always, but fairly well. Um, uh, 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 it's as we start to get more language support for concurrency um, uh, 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 coming into play, I think, where things get interesting. Because uh, I, my canonical example is, is, is just you know, implementing find, right? If you do uh, uh, find on a single threaded core, uh, you're going to search. Uh, roughly, you know, half of the items before you find what you're looking for, assuming there's one instance of the thing within the sequence that you're searching. Uh, uh, if you do parallel find, you'll split that into half and you'll, you know, on two cores, uh, uh, you won't find it in one half, but you will search the entire half and you'll find it somewhere, probably in the middle of the other half. And so it's going to be roughly searching three quarters of the data. And as you add more cores, you very quickly um, uh, are approaching searching all the data. And so, you know, a parallel find is doing roughly twice as much work as just a, a sequential find. And and throw in the overhead of scheduling all, all those tasks and everything. It's 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 uh, uh, probably consuming a bit over twice as much uh, uh, energy to do it. Um, uh, uh, so that's, you know, I, I think that's, that's going to be, be challenging. And certainly if you look at, uh, uh large server side systems, you know, s Google scale type systems, uh, 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 you find that, that it's the energy costs that start driving, uh, 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 you, you know, end up being the majority of your total, total running costs, right? Your energy costs at that scale start to, to, 
to dwarf your engineering costs for development and dwarf uh, uh, your hardware costs and all of that. And that's you know especially true these days as as energy prices have been skyrocketing. Uh, uh, this is why you start to see you know large data centers building their own solar farms and and trying to manage their own costs that way. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would certainly like to see it. I would like to see like, you know, a dash OE, which was you know, <laughs> compile my code to, to be energy efficient. I think on, on, on the other end of the scale, we see the same problem. Like, I mean, you have talked about, you know, running code on iOS and um, making, you know, porting part of, of your Adobe products to new platforms which are more mobile and more prone to energy consumption than a normal PC. Yeah, yeah, and that's a problem. And, you know, it's, uh, 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 you know, uh, Macs and Windows now, uh, you know, have a way to kind of drill in and see what, um, what the energy consumption is of various apps. And frequently it drives me nuts when you know, an Adobe product is, is listed on the top of that list on my machine. And, and uh, uh, so, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I don't think that that's as easy a fix as just a compiler flag. You know, usually it tends to be uh, something that's spending too much time staying alive, pinging a network or, or things mm -hmm. of that nature. That's the other thing that a compiler can never expect what the runtime does, so. Yeah. Um, what is your current development environment, operating system, editors, IDEs, and like offline tools, anything uh, you would recommend or won't recommend? Uh, I don't have anything too fancy, uh, for work. I do most of my work on a Mac. My personal machine is a windows box. So I tend to split my time between those two, um, uh, because I still do a lot on, on iOS and Mac development, uh, uh, Xcode is the IDE I spend most of my time in. Maybe it's probably close to 50-50 at this point between that and VS Code. Um, uh, 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 inside of VS Code, I I use things like uh, uh, Daphne, which I already mentioned, uh, which is pretty cool because if you write a piece of code in Daphne. Um, uh, basically, the fact that you can compile it means the code's correct. Uh, so it's kind of a fun, fun environment to to develop in. Um, uh, I use uh, uh, Jupyter Notebook uh, with the Zeus extension, um, which lets you run C++ code inside of a Jupyter Notebook inside of cells. It's uh, it's, it's kind of a semi-interpreted version of C++. Um, that can be great for developing uh, a, a courseware or just for developing ideas because you can basically be be you know writing your notes and have executable snippets of code in there. Um, uh, uh, even when I'm working on a, on a big product, I tend to write almost all of my code outside of that product, either in just a you know, main.cpp file, um, uh, uh, you know, or inside of a notebook or inside of Daphne and then transfer it into a notebook or into, into a main.cpp file. Um, uh, and then I lift the code and drop it into the product. So, so I'm almost never, you know, writing any significant body of code directly in the product. Right, right. The most most time I'll spend doing that will be pulling code out. Right. It's the, <laughs> it's the put in a replacement, and so now I've got to got to grind through several hundred files and 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 you know update an API or pull out a bunch of code. So you would not have been uh, you know profiting from the so-called uh, Twitter rule that only the people which wrote a lot of code stay no uh i think i generally would have been negative so i would have been escorted out i'm pretty sure um uh, uh yeah yeah it's um 
I'm also I'm I'm odd in that I I learned to program taking a lecture and I was relatively young. I was in I don't know sixth grade, seventh grade, something in there, and uh, 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 about two years before I ever got to touch a computer, and so I I I, I was obsessed with with writing code in notebooks and executing them in my head. And that habit has stuck with me. So uh, I don't bother to compile things until I've convinced myself that the, the code is correct. And, and I, I will tend so you, to work on code. Have, you must that? have a lot of handwritten code then. Uh, I used to have a lot of handwritten code. I mean, now it's like, you know, handwritten. I do type it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, do, I do sit down and type it. I no longer, you know, write it with a pencil and a notebook. Um, uh, but like I said, I do use things like Jupyter Notebook and, and I will, will you know, write all the pieces and, and things like that. And, uh, um, uh, you know, I'll work for several weeks on, on a piece of code before I even attempt to compile it. And I'm the only person I know who, who works that way. It's not a way I would recommend. It's just the way I think. Um, uh, you know, I kind of don't see the point of writing something through the compiler until I think it's right. So, so uh, yeah, I'm not very fancy with my tools. Um, which parallel computing frameworks are preferred by Adobe? Why, how did OpenCL fail? How often is Halid the better choice compared to vendor lock-in frameworks like Metal, CUDA, etc.? Yeah. Um, uh, so the well, a lot of our parallel code is written in a language called Halide, uh, which is a, 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 a language specifically for doing uh, 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 image processing, and it can target um, uh, basically code running in a thread pool on a CPU that's SIMD optimized, or it can execute on GPU or kind of any mix in between. And so a lot of our lower, lower level code is written in Halide and Halide's been a collaborative, a collaborative effort uh, to develop between uh, uh, Adobe, Google, and M MIT. Um, uh, and so, so it's kind of a, a parallel environment embedded inside of um, uh, uh, C++. And then uh, 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 Intel TBB uh, gets a fair, fairly high amount of use inside of Adobe. Uh, is probably the you know, number two most used system going next to Halide. Um, a lot of people don't know it, but uh, uh, TBB is open sourced, and uh, 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 which means like when we were doing Photoshop for the browser, uh, we did our own port of TBB to WASM. And now since then, Intel's been, been uh, uh, has released WASM support. And so even though it's, you know, Intel TBB, it does have ARM support. And so you can run it on iOS and you can run it on Android and you can run it inside of WASM. Uh, so, so it's a, a, a fairly nice concurrency environment. Um, uh, I've been uh, uh, tracking Eric Niebler's uh, kind of structured concurrency sender receiver stuff. Uh, that's not getting any play that I'm aware of currently inside of Adobe. Um, uh, I think it will. I think it's an interesting library. Um, uh, uh, solves a lot of the problems. I've got some things that I wish it solved that it doesn't, but but in, in general, I think it's an improvement over a lot of the things out there, uh, 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 which includes uh, my own libraries, which are the, the STLab concurrency libraries. Uh, those uh, I, I gave a talk on concurrency and I wrote the library uh, uh, basically well I was at C++ now because I thought I would take the code I wrote for the talk and check it into a GitHub repository was basically how that li library started. 
and uh, uh, it's it's since evolved quite a bit, and I've had uh, uh, some external contributors, uh, uh, including Felix Petroconi, who's 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 contributed a huge amount to the library. And uh, one of the key features of that is it provides uh, a portable abstraction uh, for thread pools that will back end into the platform thread pool system if you have one. So uh, uh, under Windows, it will use Windows thread pools. And on Mac, it will use Apple's libdispatch. And on Linux, it can use libdispatch if you have libdispatch. And it's got, it's configurable to use uh, the, the Qt uh, thread pool. So if you're running inside of Qt, you can use their thread pool. And if you don't have any of the above options, it's got a, a high performance portable thread pool that it will spin up. And uh, 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 so, so for that reason, it gets a fair amount of play at Adobe because it can, it can basically run anywhere. And uh, uh, it's also got an interesting uh, future model. It's, it has uh, futures with continuations and continuations behave like regular types. So you can fork computation by just copying a future and attaching continuations to it going in different directions. Um, uh, and it's got an interesting cancellation model where uh, 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 it applies uh, RAII principles to computation. And so if you let a future go, if you let a future destruct, the assumption is then you don't care about the result of any computation leading to that future. And if that was the, you know, any computation for which for which the, the, the only dependent is that future uh, will get canceled. And so you can view it as, you know, within your code, you end up with a, a graph. It can be an, you know, an arbitrary DAG of these, of computations uh, leading to futures with continuations with more computations attached to them. And as you, you let things go, the right things cancel. And, um, uh, uh, so that's been getting a fair amount of play inside of Adobe. Both our, our AI team has been using that. And there's an effort to uh, uh, rewrite the Photoshop VM system that's been using that. So, Well, we are now a bit past the hour. Do you have more time for more questions or shall we close? Yeah, yeah, if there's more questions, I can answer one or two more. Okay. Uh, let me look into... Um, there's two questions about GPUs. Uh, one is about um, PMR allocators use virtual functions, and if you write software for low-level GPU hardware, then you cannot use these as allocators if you would like to use allocators. Uh, was this a must? Uh, couldn't they make it optional to have uh, virtual functions in PMR allocators? Uh, I, you know, I've never been an allocator fan um, uh, because allocators invert the whole part relationship. So I'm much more a fan of doing kind of explicit data structures into which you, 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 uh, 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 construct objects. So, so if you need to do those things, um, you know, I think every every use of an allocator is kind of hiding uh, an, an interesting data structure. Um, uh, and I don't think allocators get much 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 play at Adobe. Uh, uh, could the V table in 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 PMRs have been optional? Maybe, I mean, if you know me, I'm not a fan of inheritance anyways. Uh, uh, it, could have, it could have gone with a type erasure approach. Um, uh, uh, you know, I also think you have uh, GPU systems uh, like CUDA, which are, are increasing looking to just run any arbitrary C++. So the problem will probably resolve itself over time as we get more uh, more fluid computation models uh, 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 executing on GPUs, which is you know a huge mess right now, right? I mean, you've got you've got Vulkan and CUDA and DX12 and Metal, and uh, 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 that's one reason why why we 
to have a significant investment in, in Halite. It's just supporting all of these GPU environments as a pain. So, mm -hmm. so that's my answer to that one. Okay. Yeah, there's a similar question about how efficient and portable GPU programming could be added to the standard. Like, you know, how do you pro uh, support GPU programming in ISO C++? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, you know, like I said, the, the, you know, CUDA guys are probably furthest along. So, you know, Bryce Adelstein would probably be a better person to, to ask this question of. Oh, yeah. um, uh, uh, and their approach is just trying to get, you know, all of C++ executing reasonably well on, on a GPU. Uh, the biggest problem that you have on GPUs is uh, uh, GPUs don't like sharing at all. And in within C++, it's very hard to tell what's shared and what's not shared. Uh, there have been, you know, a few attempts at things like uh, 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 adding annotations, you know, for, you know, restrict or or don't alias or things like that around around arguments and around data uh, uh, which that tends to be somewhat problematic to use my personal thought is that uh, something along the lines of of cpp2 or along the lines of val or even along the lines of rust um, uh, uh, where where if you have sharing the sharing has to be explicit and the default is no sharing um, uh, uh, you know, is the direction that will actually get us to to higher performance, general purpose computation on a, on a GPU. Um, uh, all of that said, uh, 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 still, uh, you know, the GPU isn't some some panacea. The the bigger problem is how do you find things to parallelize within your within your code base. Uh, uh, you know, I see an awful lot of code that's written in in environments that have you know an async await model, where the the code is you know looks like you know await make this asynchronous call, which really isn't introducing any parallelism at all. It's uh, uh, it's you know it's just just uh, a, a, a waiting along a along a single thread. It maybe is allowing other things to execute, assuming you have those other things. And uh, you know, for a lot of systems, it's it's coming up with, you know, it, unless you have things that are trivially parallelizable, like you're doing image processing operations or you're doing ML or things like that, uh, you know, it's coming up with enough work that's independent to execute across, you know, an eight or twenty or or sixty four core machine, right? So, so I think that's where the the, the larger problem is 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 how do we somewhat rethink the programming model to to scale better. OK. I think that is a great sentence to end uh, this uh, armor. Thank you for coming, Sean. Hey, thank you, Jens. It was fun. Oh, yes. And with that, I'm going to end the stream in a second. Any last words? Any uh, Anything you want to say? No, if anybody has follow-up questions of, like, DM me and Twitter is probably the easiest way. I'm at Sean Parent, so I'm easy to reach. And, uh, and thanks. Thanks for attending. Okay.